reporting. Good, a good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Zoom Time Knowledge. Uh, this is a free public lecture series hosted by the James Madison University Lifelong Learning Institute. My name is Rodney Wolfenbarger. I have the pleasure of serving as director of the program and one of the hosts for today's meeting. I'm also joined by Sue G, who you heard from pre uh, just before beginning today's meeting. Sue serves as program assistant for lifelong learning, and she is helping manage today's technology. Today's presentation is titled COVID-19 in Perspective, and we are joined by two special guest presenters, Dr. Audrey Burnett, Associate Professor in the Department of Health Sciences at James Madison University, and Dr. Chris Bernson, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at JMU. Today's presentation is designed to broaden our understanding of the novel coronavirus, and we'll seek to address three questions together. Who is most affected? What do we know about the virus? And who can we trust as reputable sources of information on COVID-19? Audrey and Chris, welcome. Thank you for sharing your expertise with our learning community today. I'm going to ask uh, Chris to unmute since he will be going first. And Chris, I know you have some screen sharing. We're going to mute ourselves. Just set it out here by, just right here by my glass. We are going to mute ourselves and be in the background to provide tech, uh, technical support. So if you need anything, just signal to us, let us know. We will unmute ourselves, jump in to help you. All right, thank you very much, Rodney and, and Sue, for uh, not only supporting the talk, but also inviting me to present today. And, and I look forward to having a, a good discussion about what do we know and uh, where we can find good information about this. Um, it's really important that scientists talk to the community and, and have these types of engaging conversations uh, because this is not just a scientific problem. This is really a community problem. And by working together, this is how we're going to overcome the pandemic. And so we really need to um, uh, work together and have great communication and, and really have a good sense of, of who, what, what we can trust in order to be successful in getting through this, this time of we're in. Um, it's very easy to look at all the information that's coming in. If you look at, watch the news, or if you go to the dashboard in the Virginia Department of Health, or if you watch any of the briefings given by the governor or other elected officials, to be overwhelmed with the words and the amount of information that is provided out there on the coronavirus. And we hear terms like diagnostic and zoonotic and, and, and other words that just don't necessarily make sense. And it's very easy to get uh, just a feeling of hopelessness and helplessness in what's going on because we don't know where we can turn to to find information and and to to really just struggling to understand everything that's going on and even I as a scientist can get really overwhelmed with everything that's coming out all the time and and I supposedly understand all of this so um, this is a struggle and and you are not alone in in trying to understand this now the way science works has been uh, highlighted very explicitly to the public right now as we're trying to understand the pandemic and going forward. Now, typically a scientist is going to identify a gap in the knowledge and then make a plan to study the gaps via experiments or analysis of other data. They'll then collect the data and, and analyze their data and, and preserve it, and then they'll disseminate it in the form of some sort of publication. Um, and so we're always coming up with new ideas and proposals that we then try to support with evidence and we put that information out there and then continue on through this cycle. Now, as we understand more about our ideas, they might change and sometimes they undergo big changes and sometimes it's small changes or refinements. And this is why um, we've had many issues with understanding this pandemic as ideas are put out there and we gather some information and then we further test our ideas and we gather more information that might change what we understand. And so the public is very much seeing the scientific process play out in real time. And if you don't have a, a, an in-depth understanding of, of, of science updating as it goes, this can cause a lot of confusion about what the truth is because we always seem to be changing our minds about what is going on. Um, it can cause some mistrust 
of science because um, you don't know what is the truth anymore. You've had this understanding, and then six weeks later, or even maybe a week later, what we understand appears to change. And there might be changes that our understanding of science does with terms of policy and how policymakers are doing uh, or, or instituting policy to protect the public. Um, and so while this seems that science is broken, um, it, it, the scientific process is working as, as it has been for the, all the times I've been in it for the last 20 years or so. But the problem is, is that we as scientists are communicating poorly and we're not providing ways for the public to effectively engage with us to understand what is going on and to understand our perspective on uh, what we know at this point in time. So this is not um, a breakdown of science. It's not the fault of the public. It's a communication issue by scientists not communicating effectively. And so one of the challenges that we have in communication is finding good information um, and identifying reliable sources of information is extremely hard, um, especially in the age of the internet where it appears you can find almost any fact just by searching on, on the internet. Now, what do you believe though is probably going to be a little different. Um, I did a search last week I looked for COVID-19 and vaccine, and I did a Google search, and I got somewhere on the order of 400 million results. That's a lot of results to try to sort through and to try to find a reliable, find something interesting and, and useful about. I then went and did the same search in something called Google Scholar. And what Google Scholar is, is it's a database that focuses specifically on academic publications. In my interest, it's going to be science, but you can also find information about history, you can find economics, you can find business, you can find public health information, but it focuses not on everything out there, but really is looking at academic information and publications and abstracts and conferences. Um, when I did that search in Google Scholar, I got a few less results, only about 100,000 results. Still overwhelming, but certainly this information would be a little bit more reliable than just a general Google search. And finally, I use something called PubMed. This is run out of the National Center for Biotechnology Information. And this is only publications that are either classified as preprints, meaning that they're, they've been verified as being scientific, or they're publications that are peer reviewed, meaning that it's been sent to a journal and uh, read by other scientists who believe that the findings are valid to a certain degree. When I do the search in PubMed, I get around 430 results. This is still overwhelming, but it might be more manageable than 400 million. And certainly the information in PubMed would be a little bit more reliable overall because there is that gateway in that it is peer reviewed for the most part, or at least has been verified to be scientific. Um, so when I'm looking for reliable sources of information, I would recommend, especially if you're looking up uh, topics about COVID-19, trying to use PubMed or using Google Scholar to try to limit the searches and, and filter out some of the less reliable information. And when you are looking for information, whether it's uh, using the sources that I'm recommending or if you're, you're searching and, or getting information from uh, social media, um, be skeptical, avoid drawing conclusions from a single source, but really if the source is a press release, really sort of say, well, this looks interesting, but I, I wanna find more information, more facts about this. Um, if you see extraordinary claims, they better have extraordinary evidence to back it up and they should have citations and, and, and some way to link it to peer reviewed science to at least provide some support for what they're claiming here. Um, and also be skeptical if it hasn't been done more than once. Um, just because it happens once doesn't mean it's, it's reproducible and trustworthy. Reproduction is, is reproducing that scientific experiments and, and, and making sure that it happens more than once is a key aspect of science. And with how fast things are coming out now, it's very difficult to see that experiments are being re reproduced, but now we are seeing that coming out and we're getting a better sense of what we understand about this pandemic overall. Um, if you decide to read a paper, um, there's a couple things I recommend. 
Um, take a look at the abstract and the discussion. The abstract gives a nice summary of the work and, and some of the conclusions. And then the discussion is going to be more of the scientists taking their results and the experiments they did and trying to explain them and put them in context. And you can really get a better sense of, of what the researchers were think, thinking by looking at this part of the paper. And then look for conflicts of interest. It would be nice to think that every scientist is purely motivated by the search for truth, but we do know that there's a lot of science out there that can be uh, motivated by uh, financial gains. And so if there's a financial stake in there, you want to consider that as you're weighing the evidence. Something that's come out in the last couple of years is something called pub peer. This is post-publication review. And so uh, when a new piece of the scientific literature is put out there, scientists can then go and read that paper and then provide comments on it that have happened after it's been published. And you get a lot of interesting discussions uh, between scientists who are reading the paper saying, well, I don't necessarily support what's going on in figure three or something weird is going on here. And that can give you some um, advice from other experts who are reading this and get a sense of what other experts are thinking. And then finally, check the citations. If you're searching in Google Scholar, it shows very clearly how many times that this piece of uh, this piece of science has been cited and then you can go and find out what those citations are saying as well so as we're looking for information find out what other scientists are thinking and and the great thing about the internet is we have that connection uh, through pub peer but also the co connections between citations that make it easier to look at what are others saying about the science so close part one, I just want to reiterate some of the, the points I made earlier. First of all, when you're looking for information about the pandemic, try using PubMed or Google Scholar. It will reduce the amount of information you have to sort through and hopefully start you on a journey to gaining more insight and understanding as to what's going on. But also understand that science is a process and we are updating ideas frequently and we're going as fast as we can. Um, we are community members too. This pandemic is at our front door as much as it's at your front door. Um, and I want to discover ideas and, and solve this problem as much to protect my family as you want to protect your family. So um, we are doing the best we can. And as we learn more, we're going to have our ideas updated. They may change, um, but we're always trying to find the truth to ultimately uh, overcome this time. So as of this week, what do we know? At least, what do we think we know? <laughs> you know, this is, this is a struggle. There have been thousands of papers put out on the pandemic. Um, and so I'm going to try to summarize some of the highlights of this and, and do the best we can, but realize tomorrow, what everything I'm saying could be different because of the way we're understanding things. But I'll do the best I can to give you the accurate information as I know it right now. This complex cartoon explains roughly how the virus works. Uh, the virus, you can think of it as a little, a little ball of, 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 of RNA and proteins and lipids. It binds to something on the surface of our cells and goes inside. It then copies what's called RNA, which is the instructions to make more viruses. And then it makes more of those proteins from those instructions. And then sort of like we wrap up a gift during uh, Christmas or for a birthday or something, the virus gets packaged all together again, and then the cell exports it to go infect other cells. And this process is playing out while you have the infection, uh, infection thousands and thousands of times. So each virus goes into a cell and makes more viruses that go on and infect more. Um, and this is what stimulates us to get sick, is um, this process occurring, and then how our immune system deals with trying to stop this process and stop the virus from making more copies of itself. Um, now the virus, like I said, is a, a ball of proteins and, and fats and, and RNA. And you might've heard about the spike protein that's found on the very outside of this protein in it. And if you look at pictures of the virus directly, um, they have these little things sticking out from it. And those are proteins that we now refer to as spike. And I'm gonna call spike the key because in the, what I'll show you next is spike allows the virus to enter your cells. 
and in doing so then unlocks the virus to release the genome and then make more copies. Um, spike is the key and the lock that that key fits in is a protein called ACE2. It's a receptor, so it sits on the outside of your cells. And when spike interacts with ACE2, it's like putting a key into a lock and that unlocks the door of your cell to allow the virus inside. And so if we look at this in a more scientific cartoon, um, we've got the spike protein and the receptor has a shape that's complementary, just like a key and a lock are complementary to each other. And once that interaction occurs, the virus gets dragged into the cell and can start copying itself. Now, the cool, interesting thing, at least from my sense, and I almost said it's the cool thing, but that, you know, science is very cool to me. And so even though this is a terrible virus, that there's lots of cool science going on that I get excited about. Um, COVID-19 is very similar to another virus, called, another coronavirus called SARS, which occurred in the early 2000s. Um, but COVID-19 appears to have changed the spike protein so that it's much better at unlocking the door. So it, it looks very similar to this, this related virus, but the reason that it's, it's more infectious than SARS was is because it's figured out how to make the, the lock turn faster. And this allows COVID-19 to be more infectious than SARS was. Now these locks, the ACE2 receptors, are found all over the body. They're found in almost every organ that you have. Uh, they're especially found frequently in the nasal passages, which is why when we do the diagnostic testing, they, send, they put the swab way up in your nose is to get those cells that have lots of ACE2, because that's where the virus is hanging out. But there's also lots of ACE2 in the lungs and on the heart cells. And so this is thought, uh, at least the, the idea is right now, is because this receptor is found in the lungs and the heart, this is why we see the cardiovascular and respiratory issues with the COVID-19, is because these cells are um, being infected with the virus and, and, and being affected overall. But like I said, this receptor is found throughout the body, not only on, on the, the nose and the lungs and the heart, but also in the intestines. And there's been reports of intestinal issues with COVID-19, and this might be the reason why. So because this lock exists on so many different cells, the virus has many opportunities to affect the body in many different ways. And this is why we see so many uh, so-called weird symptoms with this coronavirus. At least that's the idea right now. Now, COVID-19 is related to other coronaviruses. I've already mentioned SARS, which is in the early 2000s, but also there's the Middle Eastern coronavirus, uh, which is still a pandemic. It's still prevalent in the Middle East. Um, SARS and MERS affect mainly cells in the lower respiratory tract, so mainly in the lungs uh, and the tubes leading into the lungs. Um, and COVID-19 affects a similar uh, parts of the lungs and the respiratory tract as well. And so this might be why there are similar symptoms between these two sets of viruses, is that they both affect the lungs and cause major damage to the respiratory tract. But what's different about COVID-19 is that it also affects the upper respiratory tract. And, and SARS and MERS don't appear to do that quite as frequently. But coronaviruses that are linked to the common cold do affect the upper respiratory tract like the nose. And we know that colds are highly infectious. Um, I know, oh goodness knows, I have a child at home who seems to get a cold every other week. So this is, this is part of the reason that COVID-19 appears to be so infectious is because in addition to affecting the lower respiratory tract, it affects your upper respiratory tract and makes it very easy to spread this disease um, because it exists so close to the exit pathway. Uh, in the nose. Um, so really, this virus is the worst of both worlds in terms of coronaviruses. Not only does it infect the nose, so it's easy to spread, but it also can cause a lot of damage down in the lungs and, and make it very, very hard to breathe and, and long-term recovery issues as well. Um, one thing that is that we do know is because it is in the nose, it, it, this is a very easy virus to spread via droplets. Um, and so I've got a representation of a mucus droplet here with a couple of viruses in it. The droplet is huge relative to the virus. Um, and you know, each droplet has 
on the order of a couple of viral, viral particles up to tens to maybe hundreds of viral particles, depending on the droplet size. Um, relative to something like a gas, like carbon dioxide or the oxygen that we breathe, the virus and the droplet are both very large. Um, so this is potentially uh, the, the basis for how masks can limit the dispersal of these droplets. They can absorb these droplets and the virus stays on the mask and, and is not spread as easily. Because these droplets, depending on their size, can travel between a few feet. Uh, so the very large virus, uh, very large droplets can only travel a few feet, but really small droplets can travel up to 30 feet. And so um, being able to have some distance between people um, limits the exposure to these droplets. And, and hopefully limits the spread. And so this is somewhat the basis for um, why we want to wear face protection as much as possible, but also have some distance and limit our exposure between each other because that's how we're going to stop these droplets from going person to person. And given that this virus can replicate in the nasal passages, it's not very hard to go from um, getting a few viral particles in your nose to have being full on infected. Um, and there are also some questions which I, I would love to have answers to, but I, I can't give them to you because we don't know yet. Uh, one of those questions is why is there such a range of presentations in, in those who are infected? Um, we know that there are asymptomatic indi individuals. They have the virus, but they don't show any sort of symptoms. And then we have uh, patients who have the virus and they go from testing positive to the virus to being on a ventilator and then possibly dying very, very rapidly. We don't know why there's such a range at this point. And there are lots of ideas, but none that I believe are fully supported by the evidence out there. Um, but also there are some very large disparities in the disease with age, um, and we don't understand those fully yet. There are lots of ideas, um, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to give you something concrete but we just don't understand it yet. And, and those are areas that are being studied uh, quite a lot right now. And then this is something we're gonna to have to think about as we are hopefully ending the current pandemic, but looking into what's going on long-term. What are the long-term effects? Uh, we've been dealing with the pandemic for three quarters of a year now, um, it's around the world. And we are seeing uh, persons who have neurological or cardiovascular or pulmonary issues after they've apparently recovered and are no longer infectious. And we don't understand why. And, we're, and this is uh, something that we will be dealing with uh, for the next several years potentially. And we need to have a better handle on how we can support those individuals and, and hopefully limit the long-term effects of a COVID infection. Now, I've talked about sort of the bad parts of the virus. Where's the hope in this? Well, let's talk about the vaccine and the therapeutics and then I'll stop and let Dr. Burnett uh, give a lot of information about more of the public health center. So we're aiming at getting a vaccine. And the way a vaccine works is that um, it's going to mimic being infected with the virus so that you have immune protection from the virus in the future. So if you get infected with coronavirus, your body generates what are called antibodies that hopefully can bind to the virus and allow it to be gotten rid of and be no longer infectious. Now, when we get vaccinated, we similarly give a, a sense of the virus, but we don't give the whole virus necessarily. You don't have to at least. Um, we give a portion of the virus that pre or primes your immune system to know what the virus looks like so that we can prevent it from spreading. Um, the vaccinations have been uh, very effective for lots of diseases, and we're aiming to do the same thing with coronaviruses today. Um, sometimes they aren't as effective because if your immune system doesn't respond strongly enough, you may not develop the memory, so to speak, in your immune system to block the virus in the future. Um, and Sometimes we have issues where the vaccine doesn't last. Uh, fast, vaccine protection doesn't last as long as, as we'd like. Viruses uh, can change the sequence of their RNA, which leads to changes in the proteins, like the spike protein. And that can block your immunity from recognizing the virus in the future. And we are seeing that COVID-19 is mutating. 
And what this means is not fully clear, um, but it can affect the length of, of COVID-19 immunity. And, and we know that some viruses we can get vaccinated with and we get that vaccination once or maybe twice in our lifetime, it provides protection. And we know that there's also vaccines that we have to get yearly, like influenza, that we also uh, are working to, that because of the rate at which it, it, it changes its sequence. So one of the places where I get information about my vaccines and therapeutic development is uh, something called BioRender, the COVID vaccine tracker. Um, as of um, earlier this month, there were just short of 200 vaccines in various trials, and about 50 of them were in human trials. So there's a lot of, of vaccines that are currently being tested out there. Therapeutics and drugs, which we'll talk about in just a moment, uh, nearly 400 that are being developed and about 300 that are in trials. So there is a lot of work being done to work not only in vaccines and therapeutics to try to limit how the pandemic is affecting us right now. The big questions we have are, are the vaccines or drugs safe? Are they effective? And then specifically related to vaccines, how long does immunity last? Um, here's what I can say right now. Are the vaccines safe? That's why they're doing the trials. They're trying to test and answer this question specifically. Several of the vaccines are currently being tested with groups on the order of thousands and tens of, tens of thousands of, of people to determine, are, is it safe? Uh, this just takes time and is, is the major delay at the current time at having a viable vaccine, is making sure it's safe. Are they effective? It's not clear, but the literature I've read on some of the early trials with many of these vaccines are showing promising signs. So I'm optimistic that we will be able to develop a vaccine because what is being shown in the literature does support that we can develop immunity to this virus. But how long will that last? It's not sure. Right now we know that if you get infected with COVID-19 and then recover, you get having antibodies in your blood for a couple of weeks to a couple months. Um, what that might mean is that we have to give the, get this vaccine yearly, but we don't know yet. This is still a major question that is trying to be answered. How long are we protected against COVID if we take a vaccine? Um, and hopefully we'll have answers to those questions over the next several months. Um, now, drugs and therapeutics, um, are helpful if you already have the virus, and they typically target various steps of this process to try to prevent the virus from replicating. Um, there's one that has been in the news quite a lot called, called remdesivir. It was originally developed against Ebola, um, but it turns out it, it appears to be have some effects on coronavirus as well, and it top, targets the copying of this RNA to make more proteins. It appears that it does shorten the duration of symptoms of COVID, um, but this is something that's being tested along with is it a, a safe in the dosages that are currently being used in the clinic. Um, there are a lot of therapeutics out there. There are nearly 400 that are being tested right now, mostly looking to block the virus from getting into cells or the copying step. Um, but right now, we do not have any drugs that are approved for the treatment of COVID-19. Lots of hope, lots of, of reasons to be optimistic, but nothing right now is ready to, to be given to you if you are infected with, with COVID at this point. Uh, we're, chemistry is going as fast as it can. We're doing what we can right now. Um, so to close out, uh, I'd like to say that COVID-19 looks and behaves like other coronaviruses. And so that gives us a, level, a step up, at least as we're studying this. It does appear to have a wider distribution in the body than some of the other coronaviruses, and this has led to a somewhat wider distribution of the symptoms and effects. There are lots of vaccines and trials for effectiveness and safety. There's lots of potential, lots of reason to have hope, but nothing that's ready for, to use right now. Um, and there are lots of therapeutics out there which are, are hoping to slow the disease progression if you can get it. Again, lots of potential, nothing ready for use. Um, I've got a second note here about something called dexamethasone, which is something that's been uh, shown to treat the symptoms, but doesn't actually work on the virus. Uh, this has had, actually had good success overall, um, that if you have a really severe case of COVID where you 
you need full plant oxygen or maybe even go on a ventilator. For whatever reason, this drug appears to help uh, patients recover from it to a certain degree um, and is, is hopeful that this will be also a, a, another way to help. Um, it's not targeting the virus directly, it's only targeting the symptoms, but it appears that this might be something that we can consider as well. Um, and I want to close with saying that we're in mile three of a marathon. Um, and I know that that sounds hopeless, and we felt like we have so much further to go. Um, but mile three is where you set your pace and you really set yourself up for success in the future. Um, we as scientists are working as fast as we can. There are many miles to go, but we will be successful. Um, just give us the time, support us as scientists, and we will do our best to make sure that we overcome this and overcome it successfully and safely. So uh, I thank you for allowing me to present here and um, I'll answer questions after Dr. Burnett's talk and, and look forward to having further discussions with everyone. Okay, well, hello everyone, I'm Dr. Burnett, and I'm so excited to be here today and share more of the public health perspective um, regarding COVID-19. And so, of course, kind of the, the main premise behind public health is to, in fact, protect the public's health. Um, and especially in this day and age, you know, pandemics certainly are not new. Um, we have come a long way in terms of treatments, just like Chris had mentioned, um, but there's several other kind of key points in terms of access to health care, access to treatments, um, and access to hopefully um, a forthcoming vaccine as well. So introduction to the problem in terms of COVID-19 being this public health issue. And if you have followed COVID-19 in the news for the past several months, um, you've heard a lot about public health from doctors Fauci and Burks. Um, and so they, they kind of focus their attention and all of their expertise on this public health issue. And why it is considered a public health issue is because it affects so much of our daily lives, not just from the health standpoint, but even when you consider um, accessing community health services pertaining to treatments for COVID-19, um, also kind of this potential issue where will COVID-19 become worst case scenario, especially when it's paired with influenza this year. Um, and so all of these, a lot of unknowns, just like Dr. Bernson mentioned, but lots of emerging research, which is providing hope. Um, and especially with forthcoming treatments, and like I mentioned, a forthcoming vaccine, which will hopefully be effective, even if we do have to um, seek the vaccine yearly. Um, the most important point too here is vulnerable populations. So those populations that are at greater risk, and especially those for um, experiencing more negative health outcomes associated with COVID-19. Now, a lot of that has to do with perhaps someone's age, someone's race, ethnicity, um, their lack of access to health care, um, other other vulnerable populations include the homeless, um, and we've seen a great increase in the cases of COVID-19 among homeless populations, um, as well as other individuals, veterans, for example, um, who already struggle accessing health care. Um, but when it's paired with COVID-19, and then perhaps a worst case scenario with um, negative health outcomes, it just makes the situation worse, but also they experience a longer recovery time. Um, and a lot of these individuals, vulnerable populations, they may already have pre-existing or underlying health conditions. And so that will just worsen the effects of the virus. So say, for example, if someone has diabetes or cancer or heart disease, they're already dealing with an underlying health issue. And now you have this COVID-19 on top of that. Um, and so also potential long-term chronic health conditions will 
typically manifest, at least for some patients. And that's what we're seeing, just like Dr. Bernson mentioned, respiratory diseases and potential respiratory effects, even post-recovery from COVID-19. And so understanding that, yes, in fact, there are segments of our population who are more at risk, not just for acquiring COVID-19, but for potentially developing more negative health effects, where perhaps some of us can and acquire the, the virus and recover pretty simply um, for the most part, but not, not everyone. So what exactly is public health? And especially if you don't have a background um, in public health, that's an important starting point, of course. So this is the science of protecting and improving. So both of those, protecting and improving the health of people and their communities. So not just say the local neighborhood, but the entire country. So it is an expansive approach. And this work is achieved primarily through promoting healthy lifestyles. So a healthy diet, regular exercise, proper nutrition, and then researching disease and injury prevention. Because of course, yes, there's treatments for disease, but what are some preventative measures that someone may take, such as improving their diet, improving regular physical activity to then prevent um, heart disease, or at least minimize the negative health effects of heart disease. And then certainly injury prevention, such as falls, um, especially in the home setting for some individuals. Um, and so how do we prevent falls, for example, but also detecting, preventing, and responding to infectious disease. And that's what we're seeing now with COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, working together kind of as this community approach, um, but at a really national scale from that public health lens is important. Um, and especially as we figure out, okay, how do we prevent COVID-19? What are the most effective treatments across the board? How will we, in fact, um, help the uh, Food and Drug Administration get on board and help fund a lot of these treatments um, and also the CDC and World Health Organizations. And so we all have to come together, of course, to address this infectious disease at this current time. And of course, it's important to note that COVID-19 is not the only infectious disease affecting our nation, but it is, of course, at the forefront and it is causing a whole host of problems across the board for a lot of individuals. And other ways that we can prevent and respond to diseases, not just infectious diseases, even chronic diseases, but certainly through educational programs, such as what you're sitting through today, um, learning about the importance of um, preventative measures and educational programs that are happening in policy development, um, and that will be become ever more important, um, especially when we consider perhaps workplace policy vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, also administering services. So, uh, you know, that includes research, that includes community-based health services, um, vaccination programs that are either offered at low cost or even no cost, especially for more well-funded urban communities, they're able to perhaps offer um, free vaccinations and screenings, for example, and testing um, for COVID-19. And then conducting research even at, within that smaller scale um, with either, with, within the community level, conducting research in that regard is also important, not just at the national level. And then, of course, we want to limit health disparities. Um, and so that goes back to the fact where some individuals may not have access to the vaccination or to the treatments because maybe they can't afford such. Or maybe they live in a rural community where they don't have easy access to, say, a free clinic or to the hospital. It may take them a couple of hours to make it to the local hospital. And then if they're lacking transportation, transportation in general, that's just causing more of an issue um, in terms of them accessing either treatment or vaccination. 
And so we have to make sure that we are, in fact, promoting health care that is equitable, high quality, preferably, and certainly accessible for everyone. So there shouldn't be any limitations or barriers for anyone, especially when it, be, when it comes to someone's health. That is so crucial because then they're able to maintain this productive lifestyle, give back to society, give back to their own community. Um, no one really should have these vast or expansive barriers that they do today. That really needs to, we need to break down those barriers. So again, kind of going back, who in fact are these vulnerable populations? And so again, these are groups, like I mentioned previously, who are at higher risk for these poor health outcomes, especially as compared to the rest of the population. Um, and I mentioned some of these older adults, but also women and children. And so that could be um, pregnant women are also kind of more at risk because their immunity is lowered um, during pregnancy, but also even single parent households. It's also a struggle for them to access health care, um, maybe afford vaccines or treatment, for example. Um, anyone living in a lower socioeconomic status they're also highly at risk because of that lack of financial aspects where it would allow them to access quality health care. Others can include prisoners, um, also not having equal access to health care, necessary health care, those who might experience mental illness, um, homeless individuals, like I mentioned, and then veterans as well. So these are all considered very vulnerable populations, um, and they, they need a better form of access um, to quality health care, not just health care in general, but definitely quality health care. Um, that's so important. And so on top of this, not only may they not be able to access health care, but they already typically have underlying conditions. And that's what we're finding among the, among the homeless populations. They already are struggling with chronic diseases, but then when they do acquire COVID-19, they're then not able to access the necessary treatment. Or, or testing for that matter. Um, and we tend to see poorer health outcomes among vulnerable populations. And some of that has to do with unhealthy lifestyles in that they're not able to afford or access healthy foods being a primary issue, nor are they able to perhaps engage in regular physical activity because in the example in terms of the single parent household, maybe that parent is working several part-time jobs just to make ends meet. The last thing that they have time to do, of course, is to exercise. And so you have all these factors kind of serving as these barriers, um, unfortunately, for these vulnerable populations. So I mentioned COVID-19 as this public health problem. And a lot of that, like I talked about, has to do with where someone resides. So rural residents typically lack equal access to not just quality care, but care in general because of that physical distance to the local doctor's office or to the hospital. Um, and even if they can access it, do they have transportation to get themselves there? In an urban area, for instance, you have the bus system, which is pretty accessible, pretty reliable um, for urban residents, but certainly that's not the case in a rural area. So they are at a great disadvantage. Also, the lack of access to effective treatments and also to hopefully a future vaccine. So all of this comes back to the cost of these treatments and the vaccine. If they're not offered at a minimal charge or they're not offered for free um, to these residents, that's a huge problem. And it's just going to serve as a further barrier in terms of that access. Physical access, even for some urban residents that would hold true depending on the situation, of course, um, and then certainly clinical trial access. So we know that in, in terms of some clinical trials, we may not be seeing a lot of these vulnerable populations participating, whether they just simply can't access a clinical trial, maybe they don't know how to access such, um, but we need to make sure that these clinical trials are also accessible to these vulnerable populations. So then we can ensure that these treatments and the vaccine are effective for them as well. 
particularly for those who already are experiencing an underlying health condition. So other risk factors, of course, we know that even sex or gender also plays a role in terms of, for example, some diseases might impact males very differently than females. And we've even seen that with COVID-19. In fact, we've seen sex differences in terms of health outcomes. And that can be said for other viruses as well. Even ethnicity um, is also a huge piece because we also know that in terms of some diseases, some race and ethnic groups are more at risk. And even despite that, they even are more at risk for more negative health outcomes. So they have a lot of barriers in terms of kind of how these diseases such as viruses impact physically, physiologically their body. Um, I also mentioned socioeconomic status. So if someone may not have um, the necessary education or access to local services, be it um, healthcare services, or they lack the financial means to access those healthcare services, services, those are also serving as risk factors for COVID-19 um, because also they haven't had access to educational programs. Um, so they therefore don't really know maybe what steps they could take to maybe prevent a, such a disease or at least minimize the negative health outcomes and negative health effects. Um, and also the homeless population, that has been a largely um, impacted population that a lot of times kind of falls to the wayside, unfortunately. They're kind of like this forgotten or lost population, but they absolutely are at risk for diseases such as not just COVID-19, but other infectious diseases as well that can in fact turn into more fatal cases. Um, so that's also important because they can spread, of course, COVID-19 to other community members who, with whom they're coming into contact. Um, and I think that's typically a neglected point that we tend to forget about, unfortunately. So what are some potential health impacts? We kind of talked about this um, during Dr. Bernson's presentation, but certainly not just pneumonia. And a lot of times there could be the potential for a secondary infection. Secondary infections happen primarily because someone's immune system is already lowered. They already have an underlying condition, be it cancer, heart disease, and then now we have the secondary infection that could happen in addition to COVID-19, such as pneumonia, for example, whether it's bacterial pneumonia or viral pneumonia, et cetera. And then all of this also kind of feeds into this delayed recovery time, which is why even in the news reports, you may hear that you know, an individual may have had a month long hospital stay after acquiring COVID-19. And a lot of that has to do with these secondary infections that these patients are developing. And unfortunately, sometimes these secondary infections can happen from the hospital setting themselves. So think about MRSA. A lot of times we hear about that, but that is actually a hospital-based infection a lot of times. Not always, but a lot of times. And it makes sense when you think about the population in a hospital setting, they already have a compromised immune system. So of course, they're more at risk for secondary infections. Um, and then long-term health problems. We still don't know even today what the long-term health effects of COVID-19 will be. Um, granted, likely these health problems will be very variable. Just like any of us, if we were to acquire influenza, we may experience very different um, long-term public health or long-term health problems than someone else. Someone else may recover just fine, or we may develop chronic respiratory disease. We just don't know. And that's the same can be said for COVID-19. We're just not sure yet because of that novel virus status that it does have. Um, social distance. Dr. Burdenson mentioned this and it absolutely is an important public health measure to protect the surrounding community, those around us. Um, so we're not just protecting ourselves, but we're protecting others as well. Unfortunately, however, a lot of this so social distance Distance, even today, learning through Zoom, learning through WebEx, it's causing a lot of mental health issues 
among community members, such as those feelings of isolation and depression, which is why it is important, even despite social distance, to still be involved, even if it does mean um, meeting with others via Zoom or other social media outlets, for example. So I think that's a very important aspect of social distance that can't be neglected in terms of those, those negative, unfortunately, mental health effects. And then also that this additional burden on the healthcare system. So we know that these nurses and doctors, they are in the trenches day in and day out dealing with COVID-19 patients. And so unfortunately, a lot of that burden we're seeing even among the healthcare workers who are essentially our heroes um, in, this, in this incredible pandemic. But a lot of these healthcare workers are experiencing high levels of stress, as you can imagine, but also anxiety. They're afraid of bringing this disease home to their family. And especially more important, if let's say they are living with someone who has a compromised immune system, that individual will be so much more at risk. And so these healthcare workers, this crosses their mind day in and day out this anxiety is so high, not to mention the longer work hours. They already work long hours typically, but now even more so um, because of this, these astronomically high numbers of COVID-19 patients in certain states and certain urban locations. And so that's just feeding into this already burdened healthcare system and already that burdened um, feeling of stress and anxiety that these healthcare workers have. So that's also kind of feeding into this health impact of surrounding COVID-19 as well. So what are some public health measures? We talked about social distancing, the mask mandates. Um, unfortunately, that's a really important key piece. Wearing the mask, I can't stress that enough from that public health standpoint, but also understand in terms of it is detrimental to our communication with others. Um, it's far more difficult to read facial expressions when you're communicating. And as humans, we're so used to doing that. Um, even for us in recent years, you know, we, we haven't had to wear a mask necessarily unless you've been working in healthcare. Um, but now we have to, and so we have to change the way in which we communicate with others and socialize with others. Another important point about wearing masks too is it is in fact a major challenge to the deaf community who are unable to read lips um, by others wearing a mask. So while these are important public health measures, they should not be discredited. Certainly wear a mask at all times when you're going out in public, especially maintain social distance for sure, but also understand that there are negative effects um, of those measures that can happen. And so perhaps how as we as a community, how can we come together and maybe minimize those negative effects of these very important public health measures? And like what we talked about earlier this morning, the vaccine. And hopefully that is on the horizon, but we don't actually will know, at least not immediately, kind of those immediate and long-term effect, effectiveness of the vaccine, as well as the safety concerns. And honestly, that can be said for any vaccination. Um, you know, sometimes an individual may have a really negative interaction from, say, the influenza vaccine. Most individuals can take the vaccine and, and be fine. They don't have any negative side effects. But sometimes some individuals, just the way in which their immune system operates, how it works, other underlying health conditions feed into this issue as well, they may experience very negative long-term health effects from that vaccine. And so this will be a very important research area moving forward in terms of, okay, so if there are negative health effects for some patients, how can we minimize them? How can we address those moving forward, which is why it's so important to have these ongoing clinical trials for the vaccine especially. So why does it take all of us in terms of this public health perspective? Because all of us have this responsibility to protect the greater good, to simply protect others in our community. 
This is ever more important because understand that not everyone can be vaccinated for one reason or another. When you consider the influenza vaccine, for example, some individuals cannot take that vaccine because of certain underlying health conditions. The same may be true moving forward with a COVID-19 vaccine. And so the more of us who will be vaccinated, the more individuals who may not be able to be vaccinated, they'll be able to be protected. That herd immunity approach will be so crucial um, in terms of vaccination rates, high vaccination rates. Um, the role of essential health services, and this includes emergency medical services, um, the police forces, the judicial system, all of these essential services, how they all play a role in addressing, say, the, the health effects of COVID-19. Everyone should be involved. Um, certainly, it's not just relegated to hospitals or nursing homes or doctors um, or nurses. Certainly, there has to be an expansive approach to address these effects, um, whether they're health-related or otherwise in the community stemming from COVID-19. And like I mentioned, not neglecting the mental health effects from this virus as well, um, especially in relation to social isolation and that, that lack of being able to communicate with others so freely um, like we are so used to doing. And then also that continual partnership among the public private sector and community both. And so we have the World Health Organization, their involvement, the Centers for Disease Control, of course, CDC, the local health departments, they will partner with, say, the CDC. So if we are able to offer, say, a minimal cost or even free vaccines, that would be funded through the local health departments. And so their involvement is crucial, as well as research institutions such as JMU, um, partnering, for example, with the local health department. Um, how can we work with them more efficiently and more effectively to address this variety of health effects stemming from um, COVID-19, especially from this public health standpoint? And again, primarily because it's so crucial for us, whether we're professionals or community members to protect the larger communities and public's health overall. And so just some summary points and conclusions before we dive into question and answer. So like I talked about, COVID-19 is absolutely a public health issue and it definitely warrants this unified or kind of comprehensive approach. Like I mentioned, when we talk about that continued public-private sector and community partnerships, that is so crucial, especially because COVID-19 is still considered this novel virus. We don't know everything there is to know about it like we do with, say, influenza. We know so much more about influenza, even though it does, um, it does mutate year after year, but we do know more about it. So emerging research will be important, even for you all and myself as community members. Stay on top of what is the latest research. What is it telling us? What is it trying to convey to us? Also vulnerable populations. So making sure that any preventative measures that have been effective making sure that these individuals are, why is wearing a mask important? Educating these individuals on the, that important piece, educating them on the social distancing measures. Um, it's not enough to say you must do this. No, what is the science behind it? Why should we be doing this to protect the public's health overall? And then enhancing the role of essential health services. And that goes back to having, say, hospitals, nursing homes, partnering with the local health department, partnering with local research institutions to ensure that their services are, in fact, enhanced and they are, in fact, targeting and reaching even those more vulnerable populations like we talked about today. That is ever more crucial now because again, this virus is so novel. And so if we come together through that public health approach, hopefully the end result will be a more effective um, outcome for everyone and a better health outcome as well. Dr. Burns and Dr. Burnett, thank you for sharing those perspectives on COVID-19. Uh, before we, um, as we transition into Q&A, what I'd like to do is 
I would like to work through the queue that's already in the chat window. If you want to open your window, you'll be able to fully see those questions. Uh, for the sake of some people who may be joining us, uh, connecting by phone, they might not, uh, Audrey, you had mentioned about accessibility and, and being aware um, uh, of uh, not just who's affected, but, but accounting for uh, additional or special needs. And here everybody might not be able to visually see the screen that we're looking at. Uh, the first question here is about the source of the virus. I think this came in when Dr. Bernson was pre presenting. And um, so Chris, uh, what does science say about the source of the virus? You know, this is a, a great question. And I, I gave this presentation to my students yesterday. And a lot of the questions that I'm seeing are being asked by them. And so I had good practice for this and, and confirmed it. So the source of the virus um, appears to have come from an animal and it, it mutated in some way and then transferred into humans. And this is a fairly common occurrence where you have an animal virus that then uh, in some way mutates to become now infectious to humans. And we can even have it go in the other direction on occasion. So right now, it appears to have come from some sort of animal. Um, bats is one possibility. There are a couple other organisms that are, are also possible on this list. Um, but in terms of the exact location, that's a little tricky. Um, we've got these asymptomatic individuals. We've got the fact that this looks somewhat like a common cold in, in sort of the, the minor way, in so, some of the minor cases. So saying exactly when and where it started has not been fully confirmed. And that is something that is still being worked out. Um, and I hope that um, we'll be able to figure that out soon. But I can tell you for Ebola, it took close to 15 years to figure out where it actually came from. And it just took a lot of, of different approaches to work this out. Um, the big thing that uh, we're struggling with now, again, is tracking it down and trying to keep track of how it's changing over time. Chris, you, you've mentioned in your presentation and then Audrey, you, you reaffirmed that it's going to take some time to know the long-term uh, health impacts uh, of this particular virus. But in general, for scientists and health professionals, at what point do we start to understand uh, not just the mutations of the virus, but what it results in after the fact, after we think that someone may be fully recovered and we realize down the road that was not the case. When does that knowing and that understanding usually takes place with the new virus? I can say that we're, that, that I'm seeing reports right now of looking at sort of the shorter term, long-term effects, right now looking at months afterwards, trying to understand them, looking at, at a genetic level possibly. Um, and that's, um, it takes time as well. You really have to have a, a long-term assessment and the pandemic actually has to end so that we can say it's now stopped and we have a population that we can compare it to. So everyone who exists now, we can say um, could be potentially exposed to the virus. Well, now we have to wait until the pandemic ends and have a population that has never seen this virus so that we have a, an appropriate control um, and there are, are papers coming out now that are looking back retrospectively at the influenza pandemic of the early 20th century um, and trying to understand what the long-term effects were. So from the science perspective, we're doing it right now, but we really have to have a sense of when the pandemic ends. And Dr. Burnett probably has some ideas from a public health standpoint, what, what you would need to know. Yeah, and in terms of the public health perspective, I mean, I think a lot of these measures that we talked about today, wearing a mask, um, and I like the comment about really preferring physical distancing versus social distancing. Um, and so, and I agree with that comment wholeheartedly, but I, I think we're doing what we what we know and what we think is best at this point in time, um, primarily because again, it's such a novel virus, not to say that we haven't had pandemics in the past, 
we did have mask mandates in the past as well, but I think for right now, and it's kind of emerging too, there may be other even more effective measures that we can take in the future. Um, but again, with more research, of course, and, and kind of figuring out, okay, this has worked for this population, but like Dr. Brinson mentioned, what happens when we have a population who has not been exposed to this virus, then what will happen? Will the mask still be effective once this virus mutates even more, let's say in the next 20 years? Um, and so it's, it's kind of this, we're doing the best we can, both from the scientific standpoint and the public health standpoint. Um, and we're doing what, you know, it's working for the most part, I think, even with these measures. The problem comes in when people refuse to wear a mask or, you know, they refuse to maintain social distancing. And then, of course, those measures will not be effective. Um, so which is why I say it takes all of us. It really does take that public health, that public approach um, to keep all of us healthy. The next question uh, actually is about infection and uh, it says there's some discussion about virus load. Um, that virus load may determine if you can get infection. Can you explain? I think that came in during the first part of the presentation. Right. So um, if we think about a, a virus that, that it infects our nose predominantly, think about when you're smelling something. There are really weak smells or faint smells, and then there's the odor that you know is sitting right next to you. It's the same type of idea um, where um, you might be able to smell a skunk a little bit faintly far away, but if the thing sprays the outside of your house or sprays your dog, and then that dog comes inside, you can smell that it got hit by a skunk. And there's just a, there's a different um, ability to detect it. The same thing with a virus. There's a concentration, if you will, or a level at which you might have a couple particles, but you, it might not actually cause a major infection. And then there's a chance where if you get a large uh, number of viral particles that it, or bind or infect your nose, or you get them maybe through the mouth, or you rub your eyes or something like that, um, you are probably going to get infected. And so you, there's just a, there's a fine line between, yeah, you've seen it and yeah, you're going to get it. The next question is about a vaccine. Uh, if you if you do, uh, if a vaccine is um, hugely successful, the question says, do we then have to wait for the Food and Drug Administration to approve that vaccine? I guess if it was developed in another country is the question, Audrey. The approval process, and Dr. Bernson can probably mention this as well, but the approval process here in the States, as it is anywhere else, it does take time. Um, and because of the, how long it takes for clinical trials to kind of clear the way for, in fact, oh, this vaccine was effective for the majority of participants, that takes time. So it's not as though we can say, you know, Sweden has this um, vaccine that works or Russia has this vaccine that works. They may, um, but it doesn't mean that we here can't still, we have to undergo clinical trials and for that FDA approval to happen, we have to, from the scientific standpoint, prove that in fact the vaccine is effective for the majority of our participant population. And Dr. Bernson might be able to say a little bit more about maybe that vaccine approval process or clinical trial aspect too. Yes, so Dr. Burnett is, is absolutely correct. We, we, it does have to be approved in this country along with, if it, even if it is approved in another country. Um, the process for approving it requires data showing that, first of all, that it works, um, that it is safe in a majority of populations, and also identifies what the side effects might be and what the incidence rate of that for occur, to occur is. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned much in the reports about vaccines is, is even though we've got this process, there still is a, a long window of time at which vaccines are monitored. So most side effects from a vaccine happen within six weeks of the last dose. And the current vaccines are be being given in doses 28 days apart. So we're looking at from the first time a patient gets the vaccine to knowing that this problem, this vaccine probably isn't going to cause a, pr a problem in this person, 11 weeks. And the clinical trials just started in August. 
for a lot of the, the vaccines. So we're looking at at least into end of October before we would have any data saying that the vaccine is safe for, for, for any possibility. Also, the clinical trials are still going on. Moderna is one of the leaders. They're trying to enroll 30,000 people in their trial. Last I had heard, they'd only hit the halfway mark. They only have 15,000 people enrolled in their trial. They still need 15,000 more volunteers. Um, the problem is finding a population that's representative. So getting enough uh, representatives from different age groups, different backgrounds, making sure that the 30,000 who are tested, that's can, those results can be scaled to 300 million people if we just focus on the United States or 7 billion people if we focus on the world. Uh, and so that's the challenge that we're having. And you have to have a significant number of positive and, and good results from that trial before the FDA will even look at your data. Um, and if Moderna doesn't fully fill out its clinical trial in, into next year, they can't submit to the FDA until then. So we're running a numbers game right now of not only is it time and making sure that there's enough spacing between the last injection and making sure the no side effects show up, but also making sure that enough people are enrolled that we can say that this is representative of the um, population as a whole. There are a few more questions. I hope we can get to all of them here. I had intended to unmute microphones, but I do want to work through the queue that we have. The next question is, uh, I think there are three more, just to let you both know and try to best manage our time. Why does Harrisonburg have such a high incidence of COVID-19, uh, one of the highest in the nations? I think that that brings, uh, if there's any sort of similarity among hotspots developing across uh, the nation, it can happen in a very populated place, it can happen in, in a smaller place like our local community. What explains the emergence of these hotspots, if anything? Well, I think it depends on the population in a particular hotspot. You know, Harrisonburg, we have a lot of immigrant populations, perhaps, um, who may have a variety of health statuses. And so that can also kind of feed into perhaps the higher rate, not to mention the student populations um, surrounding, even surrounding the Harrisonburg area. And so these students are coming from other parts of the nation, other parts of the world, um, and they can even be arriving asymptomatically and so spreading this via that means as well. And so I think it, it depends on kind of the age demographics of a particular community, including Harrisonburg, um, or even ethnicity, cultural aspects of the population. All of those factors kind of feed into um, why a particular area would be considered a hotspot versus maybe maybe not as many cases would be um, presented in that particular area. And then one more question here. I, I, I do want to skip to the bottom. I think uh, the other question that we have about symptoms ha has been covered or is readily available information. Uh, but this question here, vac vaccines being developed. That's what we hear about on the news daily, about progress. Is it going to emerge in the timelines that we've been told? Here, this question is a little different. Uh, what aspect of, of the virus are these vaccines targeting? It, are, we know that, uh, or we've heard that multiple ones are in development. Are they targeting one or two specific aspects of the virus or are they taking different approaches? They are taking a lot of different approaches, including a couple approaches that haven't been done before. Um, there are lots of different ways to make a vaccine. The earliest ways were to use uh, inactivated viruses uh, or, or less infectious viruses to, as a vaccine. And now we've mastered, at least to a certain extent, the ability to not use the whole virus, but to use parts of the virus. Um, and then there's these new RNA viruses that is the, the Moderna virus that's being proposed, um, where instead of giving the protein to the human to prime it for the immune response, we're actually giving the human the instructions to make part of the virus, which then is produced by that, by that person, which then primes the immune system. And that's a new approach. Um, I'm excited to see what happens because it has never been successfully done. 
the data looked very, very good in terms of it being a, a good possibility, but it hasn't ever been successfully done. So what they're targeting right now appears to be the spike protein. If you remember the key that I talked about, spike protein is the main protein that is being targeted in terms of the virus. Although um, there are a number of other attempts being made uh, using either existing vaccines or other viruses that may be similar. Um, and so the reason that there are so many different viruses or vaccines being developed is because as Dr. Burnett mentioned, there might be different populations which, which, for which one vaccine or another is not suitable for. So having multiple options uh, gives us more tools to protect the community in various ways. Um, yeah, so long answer to a short question. They're, they're targeting lots of aspects and uh, there's lots of ways that I'm, I'm hopeful will work. Dr. Burnett, as we transition here and wrap up, uh, I, I have gone through the question queue, and I think Chris leaves us with a lot to think about there. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add sort of to bring us to closure before uh, I, I close things out here? Any parting words that you'd like to offer? I would just say um, it kind of takes all of us to protect each other's health. Um, and I think taking those measures that we talked about, wearing a mask, um, being socially responsible to do so, that social or physical distancing, taking those approaches and taking them seriously because they are effective. At least right now, that's kind of all we all we got basically um, until we maybe develop more effective measures or preventative approaches. Um, but I think it's really important and someone asked also about testing reporting responsibility you know and I think that's a really important piece too uh, particularly if someone is experiencing symptoms yes certainly go get tested you can do so the local health departments um, and then you're able to report those results because the local health departments then report the results to the CDC and so the CDC is tracking all of this information which is important um, in as we progress through this pandemic and in the future if we happen to have another um, epidemic happen or pandemic for that matter we will be better able to um, hopefully approach it more effectively and efficiently but I think yes I think everyone does have this social responsibility to take those measures and to be tested particularly if they're experiencing symptoms and then therefore kind of taking those measures even more so if you are in fact living with someone who is immunocompromised themselves. Yeah, and such an important reminder as we think about, and, and we don't know, it's impossible to know what's next. As both of you have mentioned, new information comes out every day. Uh, we're learning our way forward together. I wanna to thank both of you for sharing your expertise with our learning community today. Uh, broadening our perspectives on COVID-19. And to our guests, I want to say if you missed any portion of today's presentation, you will be able to access the on-demand video at our website. That web address is www.jmu.edu forward slash LLI. And until next time, be well and take care.